This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. This morning and turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter number 2. The message that I want to bring to you this morning is one that had uh, actually been on my mind and my heart for a couple of weeks, and I actually had intended it for last week, but last week was a special Sunday here at Pinnacle Baptist Church as we uh, remembered Brother John, and uh, it was just a beautiful service. i be honest with you, um, I cried more than I've cried in a long time, but it was just a sweet, sweet spirit in this place last Sunday. I want to share with you a message, though, that I think is a timely message for the day and time in which we find ourselves. Uh, Pinnacle Baptist Church is not your typical church. We are not one of those contemporary-style churches. We're just a traditional Baptist church. There aren't a whole lot of those left around uh, these days, but I kind of think that uh, that's the way a church ought to be, and I kind of think that's what folks still need today. Uh, They need a church that represents the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, teaches and preaches out of the Bible plainly and lives what the Bible says. I'm surprised at the number of churches today and the number of Christians everywhere you go that it seems like it's just as hard to tell Christians from the world as any time there's ever been in the history of the church. People ought to be able to tell that a Christian is a Christian by the way we live, the things we say, the things we do, the places we go, the way we act, even the way we dress ought to be different from the world. And uh, I want to bring you a message this morning that I think is right along those lines. And uh, hopefully we're already doing the things we ought to be doing. But all of us need to be reminded from time to time, including the pastor, that we're called to be a different people than the rest of the world. And so if we're already doing those things, uh, maybe it'll just be an encouragement to us to continue doing those things. But if there's something or another that comes up during the sermon today and the Holy Spirit says, hey, maybe you need to think about that, then I hope you'll examine your own heart as we go through the message today. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as we read our text this morning found in 1 John Chapter number 2, and it's only one verse long. Verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I want to read the second half of that verse again. That's going to be my primary text for today. It says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, I want to say before we pray this morning that if you watch television, listen to the radio, you'll hear on a pretty regular basis that one pop star after another, whether it's a singer, an actor, an athlete, a politician, one pop culture star after another will claim they just had a meeting with Jesus. They've just had a conversion experience, that now they're a Christian. Now they're born again. But then you watch the lives of those pop culture stars and seeing how they live their lives, you would say to yourself, there's no evidence at all that they became a Christian. There's no evidence at all that the same Spirit of God that lives in me lives in them. But our world has gone hog wild over stars, quote unquote, accepting Jesus and becoming Christians. And I have seen more churches inviting pop culture into the church in the name of praising these so-called stars because of accepting Jesus. Meanwhile, you look at the life of the 
pop culture star and they're still living the same way they were before they supposedly met Jesus. Now, dear friends, it's not my desire this morning to say that anyone is saved or not saved. That's between them and God. But I can tell you as a preacher of God, as a preacher of this book, that when you and I come to know Jesus as our saviors, there ought to be something that changes at the time of salvation. We ought not be the same after we get saved that we were before we got saved. The Bible says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'd like to submit to you, there are some people calling themselves Christians that are not really Christians. There are some people saying they're born again that are lying through their teeth for one reason or the other. I'd like to bring you a message this morning entitled, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you take the reading of your word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that it would accomplish what your Holy Spirit wants it to accomplish. Lord, thy word is truth, and so impress upon our hearts through your spirit exactly what you have for us today. And Lord, while we're thinking of others not living right, Lord, I pray we would examine our own hearts. And Lord, we would be mindful of whether we are what we ought to be for Jesus. Lord, that we would be in line with the word of God, that people would see something different, something real in us. But at the same time, dear God, I pray that it would be done with love and compassion for those around us. Lord, that we would not think ourselves better than anybody else, but Lord, that we would love sinners and want them to know the same Jesus that we know. For it's in His name and for His sake we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. I want to read a similar verse to the one that is our text this morning. John is also the human author of the other verse I'm going to read, but it's not found in the book of 1 John. Instead, it's found in the Gospel of John at the beginning of the New Testament. Listen to what John says, uh, quoting the Lord Jesus himself in John 15, verse 19. Jesus said this, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now, dear friends, if you've been saved any amount of time at all, and if you're trying to live for God, can I tell you this morning that the world does not love you. Just go ahead and uh, accept it. Go ahead and uh, stop worrying about it. If you're saved and you love God, and you want to please God with your life, the world does not love you. Get over having your feelings hurt. Get over trying to pacify the worldly crowd, trying to make them feel better about who you are. Just go ahead and get over it and stop worrying about it. But what bothers me as a preacher of God is to see all these people telling our young people, That I've become a Christian now, but I'm going to keep living like the world. And that's exactly what we see in pop culture today. I don't totally understand it, but apparently it has become all the rage in Hollywood to say, I've been been born again. I'm now a Christian. But see, the Christianity they have and the Jesus that They're serving is not the Jesus of that book. They're serving a man-made Jesus that's been made up by the likes of the curly-headed preacher, Rick Warren, and the purpose-driven life crowd, and all those other preachers that are preaching, you can uh, belong to Jesus, live however you want to live, and you're going to do just fine. Folks, that's a lie from the pits of hell. They have made a Jesus that is different than the Jesus in this book. And it bothers me to no end that the singing stars and the Hollywood acting stars 
and the baseball, football, and basketball stars claim they've had a come-to-meet Jesus experience, but they still go out and live like the world, and young people in churches across America think it's okay to grow up, say you love Jesus, and live like the world. Now, it bothers me because our young people, I think, are they haven't been around as uh, long as we have. They haven't seen quite as much as you and I have. I worry the most about them. But I'm not just worried about our young people because there are plenty of grown-ups that call themselves Christians that are following after that crowd too. After all, who wouldn't want to follow something that says, hey, you can be saved and go to heaven and still do whatever you want to do. Live however you want to live. Why, that's what the world's looking for anyway. That's the crowd that's looking for the kind of church where you can go and just do whatever you want to do in church. You've heard me talk about it more times than a few, so I won't uh, belabor the point this morning. But somebody told me this past week, they said, uh, Preacher, uh, I heard such and such was going on in another church, and uh, that's the way they do their services now. And I couldn't believe there was a church right here in our neck of the woods like that kind of church. Well, friends, let me just tell you, you can find a church today that will believe whatever you want them to believe and will tell you you can do whatever you want to do. So whatever your thing is in life, if you want to do it your way instead of God's way, you can find yourself that kind of church. There are just uh, churches on every corner and the ones that are sticking with the stuff are few and far between. As I've said before, though, if you decide at Pinnacle Baptist Church, that's the kind of church you want to be, you want to be a contemporary church, a modernist church, why, you can do that. You have a right to do that as a congregation, but you're going to have to find another preacher if that's the kind of church you want to be. Because that's not what God wants the church of the living God to be. That's not what God wants me to be. And it's not what God wants you to be. I don't think God wants us to be miserable, sad, walking around, oh, I can't do nothing. I remember one of the uh, youth pastors uh, that used to travel around to some of the churches in the Atlanta area, and uh, he was a youth speaker. He came and held a revival service at our church one time. TR loves it when I give this illustration. I do it for him in the car sometimes. Uh, but uh, he was illustrating what teenagers say. He said, uh, you know, teenagers never like anything. It doesn't matter what you tell them you're going to do. They complain about everything. Now, hopefully our teenagers aren't that way, right? Wink, wink. Uh, but that's the way teenagers in general are. And he said, uh, when I was a youth pastor, it didn't matter what I told them we were going to do. They always said, that is so fun. He said, I could tell them we were going ice skating. And they'd say, that is no fun. I fall down. He said, I could tell them we were going to go to the ball game and watch the big league ball team play. And they could say, oh, that ain't no fun. I don't like that team. And he said, it didn't matter what I planned as a youth activity, somebody would always say, that ain't no fun. Well, you know what? God doesn't want us to walk around not having fun. But by the same token, you can have fun and still be right with God. There are lots of wholesome things, good things that you and I can do and have and be. When we get together, we cut up a lot. We have lots of fun. You don't have to have the worldliness to have fun. But that's what a lot of Christians have been sold as a bill of goods. That's what a lot of Christians have been made to believe, even though it's not so. I was in preparing for this message I was looking up some examples of some well-known figures, actors, singers, etc., uh, that I might present to you, names you would know as illustrations for the point I'm trying to make today. One of them is uh, the actor Martin Sheen. Now, the young people might not know who Martin Sheen is, but he and his family have been involved in Hollywood for, I don't know, 50, 60 years, uh, multiple members of the same family. In 1997, Martin Sheen uh, came out saying he had had a conversion experience and got born again. Now, 
it was, of course, not long after that that he began a period of time that lasted several years of drug and alcohol abuse. Now, what does it do to the testimony of Christ when somebody says, I am a Christian, and they continue to live the same way they were living before they got saved? Now, I understand that somebody can be saved and still sin and do wrong. The Bible explains that very clearly. As long as I'm in this body made of flesh, I still have the same appetites to sin that I had before I got saved. But I'm supposed to be bringing this body under control, not it bringing me under control. And when I do something that's wrong, I'm supposed to confess that and forsake that and try to do right from then on. I'm not supposed to just keep rolling around, wallowing in the same sin that I was involved with before I got saved. And when I do something wrong, I ought to feel some remorse about it. The Holy Spirit is not going to let you, if you're saved, do something you're not supposed to be doing without saying, hey, you're not supposed to be doing that. You need to straighten up. But someone who can sin and sin and sin and just keep living the same kind of lifestyle they were living before they had their so-called conversion experience and supposedly got born again, that person can say they're saved. That doesn't mean they're saved just because they say it. But he's just one example. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 7. Now, I know you know where Matthew is. It's the first book of the New Testament. So I'm going to give you a moment to turn there while I'm turning there. Matthew chapter 7. And I want us to look at some of the verses in this chapter because this chapter in particular is used by the liberal crowd to say, See there, you ought not be doing what the preacher's doing this morning. He's judging people. Haven't you heard it before? You ought not be judging people. That's what the liberal crowd, the neo-evangelical crowd, the modernist crowd, that's what they always say in order to justify their worldly habits and lifestyles. Oh, you're just judging me. You're just judgmental. You're not supposed to be judging me. Look at Matthew chapter 7, the first five verses. This is the passage they like to use more than any other. Judge not that ye be not judged. And then they put the period in there. And that's where they stop. Now friends, I want you to listen carefully because Matthew chapter 7 doesn't end at the end of verse 1. There's a lot more to the chapter than verse 1. But if you only read verse 1, I suppose you could take it out of its context and you could use it the way the liberals and the modernist crowd do. Judge not. See, you're not supposed to judge other people. The preacher up there, he's already called out the curly-headed preacher. He called out Martin Sheen. He called out Rick Warren. He's probably going to call out some more before he's through. And I am, by the way. Uh, and they would say, see, that preacher is doing what Matthew 7 says not to do. Judge not, lest you be judged. All right, but let's continue on. Verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? That's like a little splinter. But considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. What Jesus is saying in these five verses is, listen, before you start judging other people, examining their lives, you ought to decide, you ought to examine for yourself, how does your life line up with this book? In other words, are you what you ought to be? 
Now let me just stop right here and say the preacher today standing in front of you is not all of what he ought to be. I'm still a work in progress just like you're a work in progress. I'm not yet equal, measured up to the full stature of Christ. I want to be, but I'm not there yet. But you're not there yet either. We're not quite there, but that's where we're supposed to be wanting to be. That's where we're supposed to be striving to be, to be more like Christ. We're supposed to measure ourselves by the same standard that we measure everybody else by. And by the way, in case you're not sure what the measuring stick is, this is it. This is the measuring stick. I'm supposed to measure my life by it. You're supposed to measure your life by it. Martin Sheen's supposed to measure his life by it, whether he likes it or not. This is the measuring stick. Now, that's usually where the liberal crowd stops. See, you ought to just be judging yourself. Measuring yourself. Don't worry about anybody else. Worry about yourself. Maybe it's okay for the preacher now and then, but Christians just need to stop judging other people. This passage is not teaching that it's wrong to judge other people. It's just saying before you do any judging, first of all, judge them by the same standard you're supposed to be judged by. That's this book. Don't set up your own standard of what somebody else ought to be this is the standard. Number two, don't start examining them to see how they meet up with the standard if you're not checking yourself out also. As a parent, if I accepted the dogma of the liberal crowd, I could never say to my son, T.R., we are not going to watch movies with such and such a person in it. We are not going to listen to music sung by such and such a singer. As a parent, if I believed this verse meant what the liberal crowd says, I could never tell my son to not have fellowship with anybody, even if they were not good for him, even if they were bad for him, because I'd be judging that person. The Bible is not teaching. Jesus is not teaching you can't judge People, just because verse 1 says, judge not lest you be judged. You've got to read the whole chapter. Rather, Jesus, I think, wants us to examine who we're hanging around. We ought to be examining what we're putting in through our ears, what we're putting in through our eyes, because it's all going here, right to your heart. Guard your heart. The book of Proverbs says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If you're not guarding your heart, dear friends, you're not a very good Christian. Parent, if you're not guarding your child's heart, we're not a very good parent. Grandparents, same thing. Sunday school teachers, same thing. We're supposed to be guarding our hearts and the hearts of those for whom... We're responsible to whom we will, for whom we will have to give account one day. So is the passage teaching we should not judge anybody at all? That's not what this passage is teaching. Another big name example. Several years ago, it's been five or six years ago now, uh, this Justin Bieber kid that's such a big name among the young people in the music world. He supposedly got born again. His preacher is the Hillsong preacher out there in Australia. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you, I haven't preached a message on it, but that Hillsong crowd and all the music associated with their movement and the preaching associated with their movement is not biblical. Have nothing to do with the Hillsong movement, that crowd, their music, their preaching, or anything. Now you can either take the advice of the preacher or not take it, but the Hillsong crowd is the do-it-your-own-way crowd. 
They're preaching a different Jesus than the one in this book. But Justin Bieber claimed he had a born-again experience five or six years ago. And then you look at the things that have been in his life ever since, picture after picture in the magazines and the newspapers, online, the music that he puts out, the videos he's in. It's no different than the rest of the crowd in Hollywood or the music scene. He claims to be a Christian, but he's still drinking, partying, wearing his pants pulled down by, uh, below his backside, acting in public and acting in videos, just like the worldly crowd, trying to mimic the jungle culture with his music and with his lifestyle. Now, dear friends, you can say what you want, but the Bible said, Jesus said in John chapter 15 and 1 John chapter 2, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Now, I can understand it if a Christian slips up and does something they ought not do, but they ought to get it right with God and go on. I've done it. You've done it. But the person who claims to be a Christian and they keep living that way, they're saying, I don't have any problem with the things of the world. And if you don't have any problem with the things of the world, friend, whether you're in Hollywood or sitting in my congregation this morning, if you don't have any problem with the things of the world and loving the things of the world, you need to stop this morning and ask yourself, do I truly know Jesus? Am I truly born again? You can use the term born again, but just saying it doesn't make it so. You say, preacher, I don't think you ought to be naming names like this. That might offend some people that might like those people. Well, you know what? I, I do what... Uh, the preacher who trained me said to do. I preach what God tells me to preach, and I keep my bags packed, so if this is my last sermon, it's still going to be what God wanted me to preach. You can get rid of me after I'm done if you want to, but it's thus saith the Lord. How many churches are there that their young people, the young adults, and even some of the ones that ought to be old enough to know better, have started falling for this stuff, living like this, and think it's okay because the stars do it. God forbid that anyone sitting under this pastor would be able to say to God one day at the judgment seat of Christ, but Lord, the preacher never said anything about it. We were just doing what the big name stars that got saved were doing. Dear friends, I have to give account for your soul as well as mine. That's a big responsibility, and I do not take it lightly. Parents, you have to take responsibility and give account for your children. Grandparents, for your grandchildren, to some degree. We ought to be more careful of the picture we give the world of our Savior. Our Savior... I promise you would not walk around with his britches hanging down. I promise you he wouldn't be walking around throwing up gang signals in pictures. I promise you he wouldn't be walking around with hair that looked like a woman. I won't go too far down this road, but I'm pretty sure Jesus didn't put markings all over his body either. I know, I'm going to stop there. But I'm pretty sure you and I ought to be giving an accurate reflection of Jesus to the world. Amen. Not a different Jesus, but the one in this book. Look at the very next verse in Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 6. Jesus, still speaking, says this, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. 
Now, this is Jesus speaking. So if you think the preacher's being kind of harsh this morning, look at the words Jesus used. Jesus said, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Can I tell you that the world's crowd are a bunch of dogs? And they're a bunch of filthy swine and a bunch of pigs. If you don't like the preacher saying it, I'm sorry, but that's what Jesus said about it. Christians, you're holy. You're beautiful in the sight of God. Don't take that which God has given you, holiness, righteousness, which is not your own, but the Lamb's. Don't take something God has made of you which is beautiful and throw it down in the mud in the pig pen so the pigs can waller all over it, step all over it, and then when you get too close, they turn on you too. And I assure you that's what the world will do. They'll destroy whatever beauty you have. They'll destroy your testimony. They'll destroy your health. They'll take all your wealth, all your friends. And then when the world has totally used everything that's good in you, used it all up, they'll turn on you and rend you just like a hog would. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus said they'll, they'll do. Friends, that's what the world will do. Don't take the beautiful thing that you are as a child of God and throw it to the dogs. And every time you and I entertain ourselves with things that are raunchy, things that are worldly, things that present a different worldview philosophy than this book. That's what we're doing. Well, I'm just watching a movie. I'm just listening to a song on the radio. Yeah, but you're, you're God's. You're precious in the sight of the Lord. And you're allowing yourself to be dirtied, muddy, Uglied up by entertaining yourself with the things of the world. Hey, the preacher's not immune to it as well. We're all bombarded with it on a daily basis. But are you trying to be holy? Are you wanting to be clean and pure? Does it matter to you? Or have you just given up and said, Hey, I'm just going to enjoy the entertainment that everybody else is enjoying. Friends, you and I can't do that. Because I assure you, what everybody else is enjoying in their entertainment world, it's not good for me and you. And it's just dirtying something that's beautiful and holy and righteous. We're called to be different. We're called to be a peculiar people. Not peculiar as in strange or odd, but that's the way the world looks at us. But we ought to be different. We ought to stop craving the worldliness. Dear friends, if you're still craving worldliness, there's something not right. I'm not saying you can't venture off into it from time to time and realize you were wrong and stop doing it and confess it. But friends, if you're craving that worldliness all the time, you need to do something different than what you're doing in your Christian life. You need to spend more time in the Word of God. You need to spend more time in prayer. And you need to intentionally shut those things out. Because the more you feed the flesh, the more powerful it becomes in your life. I hope you're not craving worldliness. We need to stop trying to justify our worldliness by saying, well, such and such pop star does it, and they're saved. Friends, I don't care if they say they're saved or not. If they're not living right, this is the standard, not what comes out of their mouth. This is the standard. I've heard more than a few people on television, even some preachers, 
try to talk about how Beyonce is a great Christian. She grew up learning to sing in the church. That's where she learned all her musical talent and skill. Friends, I'm going to tell you, she's not the only one. There are a lot of them in Hollywood that are not only following worldliness, but they've ventured off into something that is spiritual, but it's not of the Holy Spirit. I've seen uh, recorded videos of appearances she has made on talk shows with Oprah and others, where she admits before going out on stage to quote-unquote perform, she feels another entity, another being, take possession of her body. She even has a name for this other person, entity. And dear friends, I'm not saying this because I want this girl to die and go to hell. I want her to be saved. That's what you ought to want too. But I don't care about what she wants enough to not tell you and our young people, you need to stay away from that stuff. There's another spirit there, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's spiritism. She's channeling a demon, a devil, every time she gets ready to go on stage and perform. She's not the only one. She's just one of the few that admit it. The rest, rest of... Matthew chapter 7 makes it very clear that we are supposed to judge. You say, preacher, that's the opposite of what verse 1 said. Well, the Lord said, don't judge unless you judge yourself first. And judge yourself and them by the same standard. Now look what Jesus finishes the chapter by saying. Matthew chapter 7, look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Every one of those pop stars that says they're born again, but they're preaching a different message with their lives, they're false prophets. I know they might not stand behind a pulpit and claim to be a preacher, but they're false prophets. They're trying to sell you a bill of goods which ain't so, verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? In other words, when you go to a, a briar bush, do you expect to find grapes there on a briar bush? No. So if you're going looking for grapes and instead you find briars, you ought to have enough common sense to say, hey, this isn't a grapevine. And then he says, or figs of thistles. Now, I don't know if all you young people know what thistles are, but if you ever get your hand in one, you'll never forget what a thistle is. They look like these little uh, uh, hairy leaves that grow up, and at the center stalk, eventually they get a beautiful bloom on it. Sometimes red, sometimes purple, maybe other colors too. But the, the thistle itself has all these little, what look like hairs all over it. But if you touch those pretty hairs on the thistle, they stick in your hand, in your fingers, in your skin, and you'll spend all the rest of the day trying to get them out. Do figs grow on a thistle? No. So if you go looking for a fig, like Miss Mary has in her backyard with a big, beautiful fig tree, and instead you find a thistle there, why, you know that's not a fig tree. Your brain ought to have enough common sense to say, that's not a fig tree. And yet, how many Christians are there who say, well, that person says they're a Christian, so they must be a Christian without examining the fruit. If you start examining the fruit when the person says, I've been born again. Well, let's examine the fruit. Do they live like a Christian? Do they talk like a Christian? Do they hang around with other Christians or with the worldly crowd? We ought to start examining 
the fruit in these people's lives instead of just taking them at their word that they're born again. As one preacher once said, we ought to become fruit inspectors. Just because somebody says they're saved doesn't mean they're saved. Verse 18 says, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. These false prophets are not only dooming their own souls to hell, they're taking millions of other unsaved with them by leading them to follow a false gospel, a false Jesus. And I'm sorry to say they're ruining the testimony and the lives of a lot of Christians who are following them too. They're destroying the testimony of thousands of Christians their families, and their churches. The proof of being filled and indwelt by the Holy Spirit is holiness. Do you see holiness in those people's lives who claim to be born again? If there's no holiness, no holy living in their lives, dear friends, they do not have the Holy Spirit. The most recent of this crowd is Kanye West. He claims to have recently had a conversion experience, and he's become both a Christian and a conservative now. He's been appearing with Joel Osteen, the curly-headed preacher, and selling a prosperity gospel. By the way, he likes to brag on himself a lot while he's doing it too. Several of the interviews that I read in preparing for today, he said of himself, the world has a lot of talent. Isn't it great that the best talent has given himself to God? As though he himself has done God a favor. Meanwhile, he lives like the world, acts like the world, lets his wife run around half naked on television and in front of crowds, but he claims he's been born again. Dear friends, there's more sincerity in the confession of Jimmy Swaggart than there is that crowd. As I close, let's bring it down a little bit closer to where we live. You and I both know Christians who claim to love God, but they rarely pray outside of sitting down to the meal. They pray, uh, they claim to love godliness, but they fill their time, their ears, and their eyes with pop culture. They claim to love their church, but they rarely attend. They claim to love the Bible, but they rarely read it. 1 Peter 1.16 says, Be ye holy, for I am holy saith the Lord. Dear friends, if you and I name the name of Christ, we ought not love the things of the world. If we say we love God and we love the things of the world, the love of God is not in us. We're doing nothing but living a lie and following those who are living a lie. I hope that you won't be led astray by the Pied Pipers of pop culture who claim to be born again. I hope you won't accept their Jesus as the real Jesus. And I hope that in mine and your life, we will examine ourselves this morning to see if we're as clean and pure and holy as you and I ought to be. And if we're not, we ought to make that right this morning. Friends, there's an old-fashioned altar here. You, don't, you can be a member of our church or a visitor, doesn't matter. If God has spoken to you this morning at invitation time, I invite you to go right by the preacher, come right down to the altar if you need to, just get along with God and do business with the Lord this morning. You don't need to confess anything to the preacher. 
but maybe there's something just not the way it ought to be. And you want to make that right this morning with you and the Lord. Maybe the Lord's dealt with you about something that I haven't even talked about this morning, but the Holy Spirit has been speaking to your heart. Quench not the Holy Spirit. If He's speaking to you, please respond. And lastly of all, if you'd say, Preacher, I'm just not sure I'm saved. Or Preacher, I need you to pray with me. Whatever it might be, if you do want the preacher to pray with you, you come take the preacher by the hand, tell me why you're coming, and I'll be happy to pray with you. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet, Brother Jim, we're going to do something different this morning. I'm going to ask Mary just to play for our invitation. So heads are bowed, eyes are closed, please. No one looking around. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for a chance to be together and worship you this morning. Father, I pray that you would take the message that you delivered to this preacher. Help the preacher to put it into practice in his own life. And then, Lord, I pray that each and every other person here would do the same. Lord, help us to want to be more like you, not like the world. Change our desires, change our wants, change our appetites to be holy, spirit-filled desires. I pray you'd use this invitation for your glory. The head still bowed and eyes still closed and no one looking around. Mary, whenever you're ready, you can begin to play. As Mary begins to play, if God has spoken to your heart for any reason, I'm going to ask you to just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. But if God has spoken to you, you step right out. You can come get along with God up here at the altar. If you want the preacher to pray with you, take me by the hand and tell me why you're coming.